नमस्ते थैंक यू सर फॉर जॉइनिंग अस एंड फॉर बीइंग अ टीम विद मी सर श्री एम डज नॉट नीड एनी इंट्रोडक्शन डज नॉट टेक मोर टाइम आई ओनली होप दैट यू नो थ्रू द कोर्स लाइक दिस मोर मेनी मोर यंगर स्टूडेंट्स विल बी इंस्पायर्ड टू टेक दिस फील्ड द एरिया ऑफ सेल्फ डिस्कवरी एज अ वेरी रिगरस परसूट इन देयर लाइफ्स एंड होपफुली इन द फ्यूचर वी विल हैव मोर सच कोर्सेज एंड मोर सच प्लेसेस इन द कंट्री टू डू दिस एंड यू नो for the students to learn from you know masters like triam so without any further ado i'll just pass thank you sir thank you prof uh, i for my side it's a privilege to address the iit delhi mm -hmm. uh, you are sitting in the center of all that happens in this country and uh, your iit is one of the most important iits in the country and so i'm so happy that we have decided that the students and all the others who are here um uh, i would like to start like professor uh, rahul garg said exploring uh the consciousness so we are going to start uh, with that i was given a list of what we are going to do and uh, the first thing on the list is experiences of altered state of consciousness by the sages now before we go into that i think we need to look at the perspective of what the most ancient teachings on consciousness uh i i would say the most ancient in india but probably is most ancient in the world uh the upanishads so the teaching process also should be uh, i would expect to be like that in the upanishads now i want to also say that i might use a lot of sanskrit but i will translate everything that i use and please don't think that sanskrit is a denominational language that it belongs to a particular uh, a religion or culture yes culture yes but Sanskrit is an ancient language uh, and the ancient texts that we have in this country have all been done in Sanskrit and not only the philosophical texts but also Kavya Kalidasa Kalidasa didn't write anything about religion but it's uh, the great epic uh, poet uh, Valmiki when uh, Aryabhata and other mathematicians and the ancient texts called the vimana adhikara and so on they are all written in sanskrit and maths is one particular vedic mathematics is a very important part of uh, our culture so when i use sanskrit don't think that uh, sanskrit is some kind of a foreign language unfortunately people today don't know the language and therefore they likely likely to say oh again scriptures so i'm going to start with that uh there is a beautiful upanishad uh which has only 12 verses it is the shortest upanishad in the literature called the upanishads now before we go into that to understand how we approach this subject or how the sages approach this subject of consciousness i'd like to explain to you the meaning of the word upanishad first mm. uh there is a tendency to think that upanishads are not for everyone they are very complicated you uh, everybody cannot understand it or that you have to become a renunciant or a sanyasin to understand it and so on all misunderstandings when i was with baba ji my guru maheshwarnath baba ji he said make it a point to to teach the upanishads because they are not as people think of course there are complicated upanishads but there are they are direct simple and to the point but how you look at the point and explore is not easy but they don't try to deliberately complicate anything they are very straightforward and clear and is one of my jobs given to me is to simplify the upanishads and let people understand the the treasures that we have in this country so upanishad now we are familiar with the word vedanta 
Everybody says Vedanta. Now, what is the meaning of the word Vedanta? Here I would like to say something. Many, many years ago, I was, uh, I went to Harvard and I had a talk at uh, uh, one of a small group in Harvard. I'm talking about the late 90s. And as I was talking, uh, a professor who was sitting in front was listening very carefully to what was going on. The subject was understanding Vedanta. So he said, sir, excuse me, I need to have ask you something. I said, yes, sir. So he stood up and he said, mm, he didn't stand up, he put up his hand and he said, when you say Vedanta, because you are saying Vedanta, the subject is Vedanta, which Vedanta are you talking about? Is it the Advaita Vedanta of Shankara? Or the Vishishta Advaita of Ramanuja? Or the Dvaita Vedanta of Madhvacharya? Or all that is in between, Vallabha and so on. I was very happy because you talk about Vedanta in India, nobody even knows that Vedanta has so many parts. I was surprised. He was not an in Indian. He was a professor from Harvard doing his philosophy. He was teaching philosophical studies. So we need to bring about this awareness in our youngsters that there is a vast subject untouched. And like uh, Professor Garg said, when you go into IITs, you are in institutions which are elite, which are supposed to give you scientific understanding. And when you come out, you are a perfect scientist or a technology, whichever way you want to call it. I think there's much more to it than physical science, when you say science. This is one of the arguments that's going on. Anything that cannot be explained by the so-called physical science of today doesn't exist. I'm saying, can we move forward a little? There was a time when people thought that the world was flat. Uh, for years we have been uh, working on Newtonian physics. And then Einstein had to break it. All I'm trying to say is a mindset of exploring. And not saying, oh, it is all done, this is over. has to be there. This is very important, especially for young people who are studying science, that the, the, the curiosity and the interest in exploring new things, because it may, all the answers may not be there in what we have already done and studied. There may be more answers coming up. There are more things to explore. And I am of the idea that the tools to explore consciousness are not very much available today in so-called physical science. So we have to step out a bit. And then perhaps you can find out ways and means, perhaps even gadgets, to help you to explore it. But first we need to have a base. You need to have a theory to expand. You need to have a hypothesis. Now geometry has a hypothesis, Pythagoras theorem, old geometry that the uh, square of the hypotenuse would be equal to the square of the base plus the alt altitude. Right. Now, how do you prove it? By actually drawing and perfecting a triangle, you prove it. So, before proving, you have a hypothesis. Right. And then you set about trying to find out, explore how to prove this. I would say that when you come across passages in the Upanishads, for instance, or in the Yoga Shastras, which appear to you as hypothesis, suspend your judgment and say, I'm going to explore and find out. Don't reject it out of hand, saying, oh, this is a mere hypothesis. Hypothesis can be proved. And if at the end, if you cannot prove it, you can reject it. So let's look at it that way as a study, as an exploration. Now, Upanishads. Mm, when you say Vedanta, the word Vedanta means, I'm saying this because there are many young people who probably have been told or not studied this, not so important that we think, uh, but they are very important. The subject we are dealing with is the core of our consciousness, the 
what am I actually? Who am I actually? Am I only this body with the brain working constantly and so on, um, getting married, having children, dying? I mean, am I more than that or am I just this, con- this little ID? So for a 2000 years, the question, the identity crisis has existed. Not new. People started asking, who are you? Nowadays, when you fo- if you have a fight in the street, uh, then you probably ask, who do you think you are? <laughs> so, this who am I and what am I really? What is my connection to the world? This has been a very old crisis, nothing new. And the rishis have tried to explore this question and find answers to this. This is what we need to understand. Plus, the fact that there are other modes of understanding than the ordinary uh, one plus one is equal to two. Again, quantum physics has uh, worked on this and proved that sometimes Newtonian physics doesn't have the answer when it comes to the ultimate units of nature. In fact, we don't even know exactly how they behave or what they do. We can only because we can't see it. Not the most powerful microscope can see a quantum unit. You know it only through the reactions when they when they pass through a certain chamber. And so today the controversy still goes on whether the smallest unit is a particle or a wave. Nobody knows. So from absolute certainty of Newtonian physics, we have come to the uncertainty of the law of probability. Probably. People have even gone to the extent of saying it could be dependent on the observer. Nothing has been proved yet. It's for you young people to go into this and prove and find out what it is all about. Now, all I'm saying is, so have an el- healthy interest in exploring these matters. Open up your mind. Don't stick to the principle of only 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. Maybe in arithmetic. We need to go beyond arithmetic. We need to go into abstract mathematics and beyond. Mm. So... Vedanta. You know the Vedas, the four Vedas, uh, the Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Asama Veda and Atharvan Veda. These are the four Vedas that, and they are very ancient. Uh, still the controversy is on how old they are. They are very old. And perhaps they might have been written, they were not written in those days, they were studied by rote, repeated and somebody picked it up. Writing came much later. It was Veda Vyasa who actually uh, uh, com- compiled the Vedas, which were scattered, and made them into four sections. <clears throat> in fact, the word Vyasa in Sanskrit means a compiler. If you simply say Vyasa, it means a compiler. Veda Vyasa, one who compiled the Vedas. Now, the four Upanishads, I'm sorry, the four Vedas. Now, if you read the Vedas, if you look into them, something interesting comes up. When you say Veda, it is not just the Samhita or the hymns portion which is the Vedas. Vedas is a big body of literature starting with Samhita, then to the Brahmanas, which are rituals to be performed, and which have a reason, of course, and then the Aranyakas. That part of the Vedas which are studied in the forest, in the Aranya. And from Aranyakas, there is a smooth movement towards the Upanishad, which is the essence and the crux of the Vedas, which explained the four Mahavakyas which are in the Vedas, which we will look into later. We won't look into that. The four formulas, the four hypotheses, the for them it is a certainty because the rishis saw, saw it not with their ordinary limited brain but with something beyond. This is what we are trying to explore. Is there something other than the understanding that comes with our limited so-called logical rational blueprint? We explore it. I am not saying you should accept it or reject it. Let's look into this. So, this is the Vedas. So since the Upanishads come at the end of the Vedas, the last part of the Vedas, therefore they are called Veda Anta, end of the Vedas. It also means that which when studied 
one has completed one's studies. Anta. These are the two word meanings of Vedanta. Now the word meaning of Upanishad. Upanishad has three parts. Upa, Ni and Shad. Now, Upa means near. What is Upavasa? To move towards nearer to the Supreme. Not fasting. I mean, it's good to fast. That's a different matter. It's a practical thing. But the real meaning of Upavasa is to move towards nearness of that Supreme Being. Now, Upa therefore means to go closer, to come closer. Now, there are uh, many, those days, there, there was no internet. I hope, I don't know, I'm not so sure yet. But perhaps there was no internet. And so, when you talk important things, you can't sit in Delhi and talk to me in Madhunapalli. You have to come and sit in front of me. Now, while internet is fine, without that we won't be able to do this, I must say there is a lot of difference from actually sitting face to face and studying something. It, there is no replacement for it, of course. So, the rishis, who are the teachers, they sat close to the students and taught these matters, which were called rahasyas. Why were they called rahasyas, secrets? Not because they wanted to keep it away from others or the general public. It's because they were dealing with such powerful forces and understanding that in wrong hands it could be used in a different way. You are unleashing a 100 megaton bomb by teaching a guy how to press the button who doesn't know that he should not press the button. So it was treated confidentially, not because of any other reason. So, so the teachers sat close to the student. Therefore, upa to move closer to the teacher, it also means to move closer to the truth. Because from the point of view of the Upanishads, when you actually touch the truth, there is only the truth, you don't exist. So, all you can say is to move close, as close as possible. And the last uh, syllable, Shad, Shad literally translated would mean sit, sitting down. So, sitting down, sitting close to the teacher and listening to what is being said. So, Shat means it. Adi Shankaracharya was a great expert in Sanskrit uh, meanings. Said Shat also means, one of the meanings of Shat is to shake up, agitate, to shake up. To shake up what? To shake up the ideas that we have so far, the way we think so far, and to explore if there are other modes of thinking, which are different from the modes in which we were now, we are now. How are we taught? From, there's an object here, and I'm here, and if I need to get that object, I have to move in a linear fashion and touch it. Now, Upanishads are dealing with consciousness. Consciousness is here, there, and everywhere. So how do you move to something which exists right here? How? I mean, if something is there, I have to move there. But if something is here also, there's no movement. In fact, when all movement stops, perhaps what touches... Let's, we'll discuss that later. So, Shad means to shake up your ideas. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, 15th chapter is called Purushottama Yoga. I'm using, I, I'm discussing Upanishad, but please remember the Gita is also an Upanishad. It's the essence of the Upanishad in simple words. Srimad Bhagavad Gita as Upanishad Subrahma Vidyayam. That's how it is taught. Now, the 15th chapter gives a very nice metaphor, very interesting. It describes there is an upside-down people tree, Ashwata tree, 
whose roots are up above and branches down below I mean, normally we don't see such trees the roots are down and the branches are up it's a turning around of your way of thinking if you look at it the human body is similar to what has been described the roots are here everything starts from here everything is the brain controls many the whole body this is the root and then the rest of the branches are the body this is one of the explanation is wider than that mm. so shat means to shake up your mode of thinking and shankara also said shake one up from the sleep of ignorance mm. then there is this middle word ni upa ni shat the ni is a link between the two words and it indicates the position of the seeker in connection with one who is teaching the one who is teaching is here and the one who is studying is here because as maheshwana my teacher explained to me when you pour something from a vessel you cannot pour into another vessel which is held on top it has to be down you receive it so the receiving point is called ni and it is the uh, of course the root of the uh, word niche in hindi that means i'm sitting down looking up listening carefully to what is being said shaking up my mind which has been going in a certain pattern and breaking the pattern so that i can go into that which is boundless this is the upanishad now little bit of academic information which is that there are many upanishads out of which 11 upanishads are considered to be principal upanishads usually i don't go into this details but we are in the iit delhi the students would like to know the details <laughs> so there are 11 principal upanishads Uh, which means eleven Upanishads, which are oldest Upanishads, older than the rest, and which have been commented upon by all the great Acharyas, starting with Shankara. Perhaps before that, but we don't. We have no available uh, translations or commentaries. But from there on, many teachers have commented and translated the Upanishads, the eleven principal Upanishads. Today, since we are. Uh, on the subject of altered states of consciousness or rather i wouldn't say altered because it's altered states of consciousness sometimes appears like altered states of consciousness brought about through the use of drugs and so on we're not into that we're not of course that is also altered no no, no question we are looking at consciousness per se what are the modes of consciousness that we normally know about or is there something that exists which we don't know about and that does not fortunately require uh, a test tube or an experimental uh, physical object because we are dealing with the mind and the mind can deal with the mind you don't need it you can't put it in a test tube anyway so hmm? uh, so today out of the 11 principal upanishads i'm going to deal with an upanishad called the mandukya upanishad it's because why because you'll get bored some upanishads are so long there's an old upanishad called one of the principal upanishad brihad aranyak upanishad the very word means it's a big forest brihad aranyaka so if if we young people not me you go into it you probably go round and round and get lost let's look at something concise which gives the gist of the teachings on consciousness and that i have picked the mandukya because it is the shortest upanishad among the principal and it has only 12 verses only 12 verses and in these 12 verses it has summed up the essence of what the ancients thought about consciousness believe me the ancients did not accept something because somebody said they looked they explored they found out there is some there are some such illusions among people that oh they accepted no 
they looked critically they discussed in the forest academies the students had long discussions with the teacher they called they're not debates they're dialogues by samvada the gita is also called a samvada although most of the talking is done by krishna but it's a samvada iti shrimat bhagavad gita upanishads brahma vidyayam yoga shastre shri krishna arjuna samvade it's a samvada between arjuna and krishna so <coughs> The Mandukya Upanishad belongs to the Atharva Veda, Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, Atharva Veda, and it has only twelve verses. Now it's very interesting. It's perhaps academically interesting, but I'm not going into detail. Adi Shankara, Shankara Chari, Shankara Bhagavat Pada wrote commentaries on so many Upanishads. Of course, he first wrote the principal Upanishads. uh and his teacher was um, govinda pada and his govinda pada's teacher was gauda pada now the standard textbook or the first uh, discussion and commentary on the upanishads the most ancient probably is gauda pada's karika on the mandukya upanishad In fact the teachings go sometimes so close to the Buddhist teachings that some people have also said that Gaudapada was a Buddhist in disguise which is not true he was only exposing the he was only teaching the Upanishads his expositions are on the Upanishads not on Buddhism but the, the it's so abstract that people sometimes think that his definition of uh turiya is very close to the Buddhist definition of nirvana. So, Gauda Pada's uh, commentaries on the Upanishads called the Karikas run into hundreds of pages. Mandukya and Shankara's commentaries on that run into hundreds of pages. So it's it's a big thing, but the Upanishad by itself is just 12 verses and it's very simple. It doesn't tell you do this, don't do this. no do's and don'ts it's an exploration into the states of consciousness which are common to all human beings man or woman black or white swiss or indian loka samasta sukino bhavantu is the principle so the whole world for common to all human beings and the significance of the word om we are divided into three syllables a u and m mm, ma through understanding the the significance of the word om the upanishads takes us to the understanding of the different states of consciousness common to all human beings this is required before we go further um now the word mandukya actually the word manduk in sanskrit means a frog so some people say that it was it's a frog upanishad or someone uh, a rishi who taught it might have looked like a it's not it simply means that no matter wisdom comes even from a frog it's wisdom <laughs> one and second it is because a frog is not in accidentally chosen it's a deliberate understanding because you know frog is one of those creatures that visibly undergoes metamorphosis first it's a little the eggs become tadpoles with a tail and they live in the water then then the tail is lost the shika is lost and you become a sanyas I I'm not joking. So <clears throat> uh, from the water then it loses its tail and then it learns to come on earth on the land. So till now it was in water now it is a land creature but the frog can live both on land and also in water it's an amphibian. So the 
the student who understands the Upanishad is not otherworldly, but he sees, he lives in this world and can go to the other when he wants very smoothly. This metamorphosis of a creature that lives in water into one who can live on land and also on, in water when required is the illustration of the growth of the mind of the student. So, uh, Mandukya, anyway, it's a big contrast. Somebody says there was a Rishi called Mandukya who wrote it. So, we'll, let's not go into that too much. We'll leave it there. Let's start. I'm going to use the Sanskrit, but only for a short uh, for the sloka, but then I'll translate it and try to explain. Um, I have the text in front of me. The Bandukya starts like this. It describes the significance of Aum. And it says, Om iti eta daksharam midam sarvam tasyo pavakhyanam bhutam bhavat bhavishyad iti sarvam omkareva etchanyat Trikalatitam tadapi omkara eva. It says Om, A U M, A U M, Om. This syllable is all this. It is everything. There is nothing which is outside this Om. Why? It will be explained why it said, why this is being said. It's not just a statement. Om, this syllable is all this. Now, Tatopa Tasya Tasyo Vakyanam. Now we describe why Vakyana is made. And what is the Vakyana? Explanation is all that is the past, all that is the present, and all that is the future, all this is the syllable Om. Please, this is a hypothesis right now. And whatever else there is beyond the threefold time of past, present and future, that too is the syllable Aum. Now, now I think if I go on with the Sanskrit, Students may get a little impatient, so I'll go on to the translation better. Instead of Sarvam He Yetat Brahma and so on, all this is verily the Brahman. Second verse, the self is Brahman. This same self has four parts. Now look, this we have to look at carefully. First they said everything is Om. And then they said everything is the Brahman which means Om is the visible symbol of the all-pervading Brahman. Brahman is, is not Brahma, the creator and so on. It is the ultimate essence of life, of this creation, or even before the creation. That which exists before and that which will exist forever. Incidentally, the word Brahman derives from the root Br. Brah means to expand, which means an ever-expanding universe. And therefore an ever-expanding consciousness. There is no limit to consciousness. The ever-expanding consciousness is Brahman. So, everything is therefore Om and everything is therefore Brahman, which means Om is a symbol of the Brahman. Then, next step. So, is that Om or is that Brahman to be found Elsewhere, outside the world, the Upanishad says, this self is Brahman. I am Mahatma Brahma, one of the Mahavakyas. Myself itself is the Brahman. You don't have, don't have to look for the Brahman anywhere, it's here. Myself, I am myself. When the mind has calmed down and quietened down, in my true essence, I am that Brahman. And this Brahman, this self, of mind as four parts or this whole consciousness which is me if I'm unconscious I can't even realize that I'm there this whole consciousness which is me is divide Upanishads divides it into four quarters 
just for the purpose of study. Actually, there are no facts. It's for the purpose of study. And if you look carefully, you will see that it exists in all human beings, just as described in the Upanishad. What is that? The first part of this consciousness, if it can be divided at all, except for the purpose of study, is called the Vaishvanara. And what is the Vaishvanara? Because it is that which leads all the creatures, living creatures of the world, which is prominent in all living creatures of the world. That's why it's called Vaishvanara. And and what is its activity? What is its sphere of activity? The waking state. The waking state where the self cognizes the external objects. Now, of course, there is a description of seven limbs and eighteen mouths. We don't want to go into this. These are the different organs of perception described in different ways the karma indriyas, the jnana indriyas. It's sufficient for us to understand here that the first quarter is the waking state. The first part is the waking state. It's called jagrita sthano, awakened state. We are all familiar with that. Every human being is familiar with that. No one is free of the waking state, I hope. Hmm? And what is its uh, function? Bahis prajna, that which recognizes everything outside the waking state. So this is the Jagrita Avastha. Isn't it common to all of us? Don't we derive the understanding of this entire world in the Jagrita? Because this is the state which, which recognizes the outside world. It is Jagrita Avastha now, because I recognize you there on the screen, I recognize people here who are recording and who are sitting here. So, I recognize myself. What happens when I wake up? First thing I recognize is, okay, I am awake. I. And then when I am there, I see the other. First I, then the other. If I don't know about me, I won't know about the other. So, it's the basic consciousness, level of consciousness of all human beings is called the first quarter, which is represented by A. We'll come into that later. But, Jagrita. Okay. In Jagrit, what happens? We recognize the world. We recognize that we exist. And we recognize, therefore, that the world exists. And all the five indriyas, the sense organs, work in the Jagrata Avastha. Eyes, ears, tongue, smell, and touch. We have no other inputs. Where are the other instruments of perception? We have only five. Now here I want to say something interesting, which we need to look into carefully. All that we call our thought process, all that we call our rational blueprint is dependent upon the data, inputs that come from our five senses. There is no other way. And then the brain or the mind, whichever word you want to use, takes this data and then builds up a blueprint of this is what it is, this is how it is. This. We have no other source except the five senses. The rishis of ancient times have asked this question. What if the impressions or the data gathered by the five senses, what if? May not be, always, but what if? is inaccurate, is not accurate, is inaccurate. If that is the case, even if few cases, then the data which the mind processes 
to make its own blueprint, rational blueprint, could be gone, will be wrong, could be wrong, could be. Because the data is wrong. I'll give you an example. Every morning, we see the sunrise. Everybody knows. We see the sunrise. And every evening, we see the sunset. But it was proved long ago that the sun neither rises nor sets. But if we depend on our main organ of perception, the eyes, chakshu, we see the sun rising and setting. That is the data we gather. But can we conclude because of the data that the sun is actually rising or setting or that the world is moving? So, the mind here at some point has gone beyond trusting the eyes and saying, no, 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 that's what the eyes may be saying, but actually the sun is neither rising nor setting. We go a step further. So, the sense organs, at worst, they would be misleading the impressions that they give us. We all know that a jaundiced man cannot eat the best food that is offered to him. Food is good, but he is jaundiced. So, therefore, what the sense organs feed us, the data, the inputs, are sometimes relative, sometimes not perfect. And this whole blueprint of logic and uh, rationality that we create is based on this. First of all, they are limited. Beyond a certain point, the eyes cannot see then I have to have a telescope or a microscope. Beyond a certain point, my ear cannot hear. When a bell rings, you think the bell ringing has stopped, but it has not stopped. It reverberates endlessly. But I can't hear it because my ear is built with a certain frequency. Beyond that, it cannot hear. A human being cannot hear a dog whistle. So, the inputs that come from our five senses are limited. That's what I'm trying to say. And the entire blueprint that we create from that could be flawed. Could be. Please let's suspend our judgment. I'm not saying is. Could be flawed. And all this happens during the waking state. And we give so much importance to the waking state, which is okay, that we don't even consider that there could be other states of consciousness other than the waking, which we all know exist actually. And therefore, the fourth uh, sloka of the Mandukya, Svapnasthano Antaprajna, that means the next quarter, the next part of one's consciousness, Om or the Brahman, which is the Self, is what is called the dream state. It's also called Taijasa. Because, you know, you may be dreaming in utter darkness, but you see light in the dream. It's self-illumined. It's called te- doesn't require the sun. Taijasa, self-illumined. This dream state, here one recognizes internal objects. There we recognize outer objects. Here we recognize internal internal objects. And believe me, when in the dream, when you recognize the internal objects, they are as real as the physical world in the Jagrit Avastha, where you see the physical world. It's very real. In fact, it's so real that uh, in the dream, if a tiger is chasing you, you wake up sweating and panting and palpitating and looking around to see if the tiger is there. Because At that point, the tiger really existed in your mind. Well, Rishis have asked this question, what if one day we wake up and say, oh, this has been a great dream. We will not go into that at the moment. We will discuss slowly. So, the dream state. So, from waking state, the other mode of our consciousness is the dream state. And the dream state is so, so real. The difference between dream state and waking state is there of course, which is, I might dream that I am a king. 
Nowadays that's not good. I might dream that I am the Prime Minister. No kings are there anyway. Huh? But when I wake up, I am still the same. I am living in Mandapalli, who has no qualifications. So, uh, while this M continues in my waking state every day, but in the dream state, it can change. But it is not continuous. So, that continuity is not there in the dream. Every other thing is similar. We are experiencing, we are loving, we are dying, we are... Everything is happening. We are eating. So, this is the next part of our consciousness, which we are all aware, common to all humanity. Everybody dreams. Night dream and day dream also. We all dream. So, the second part of our understanding, our self, is the dream state. But then is that all? The Upanishad says, the other one, the fifth state, Yatra Supto, is called Shishupti, deep sleep, where there are not even dreams. There is no waking consciousness. There is no dream. And yet, everyone needs it. I think one of the most uh, fast-selling drugs in the medical shops uh, are tablets to sleep and tablets for depression. Sleep is so essential and sleep is the third part of our consciousness. Actually, it's all one, but we are, for the purpose of study, dividing it into. In deep sleep, what happens? There is no outer cognition. There is no inner cognition, like in the dream. There is no combination of the two either. Everything is ended. But I am sleeping. I am not dead. I am I'm alive. But to all intents and purposes, I appear to be dead. There is no contact with the world, no contact with the inner world. There is no awareness. Nothing is happening. I am in deep sleep. And it is so essential. Why is it essential? If you don't sleep, you go mad. So what happens in deep sleep, in Shushupti? All our identities are removed. Or at least we are not aware of our identities. I don't know who I am or where I am and what's happening, nothing. The, the uh, owner of a factory and the laborer in the factory both sleep, they are equal in sleep. Perhaps the laborer sleeps better than the owner because he works hard and he goes to sleep. Owner is thinking of what will happen tomorrow. But they all sleep and in sleep we are all equal. There is no different sleep for an a Indian or for an Englishman. They are all sleep. It's the same sleep. We all sleep. And in sleep, we also seem to experience total relaxation if you are properly sleeping. Total relaxation and freedom from all worries. Which is why it's essential to have sleep. The world would go madder than it already is if there was no sleep. Hmm? And what happens is, even though we are not aware while we are asleep of what is happening, when we wake up, uh, we usually say, oh, that was a blissful sleep, a wonderful sleep. Uh, the proof is that in the morning when you want to wake up, you may have an alarm. The alarm will ring and it will stop and you put it off and again sleep. Why? Because it's so blissful, so restful, you don't want to come out of it. And when we wake up, even though at, in deep sleep we are not aware, when we wake up, especially in that time between waking up and sleeping, twilight zone, we understand how blissful the sleep was. So the Upanishad says, if I know now that how blissful the sleep was, perhaps there was a witness there existing, which didn't know at that time, but now realizes. 
So, the Upanishad says, when you divide Om into A, U and Ma, A represents the waking state, the first sound. U represents the deep dream state. And M represents the ending of all, which is sleep, deep sleep. So every human being in the course of one's life daily goes through birth, through life, through imaginary worlds and ends in death, short death, sleep. Every time we sleep, it's a nice little rehearsal for the final rest. Of course, the breathing is going on, so you don't die. But it's kind of an understanding of what happens after death. So. So, A is waking, Jagrata, U is Sopna or Taijasa, and M, mm, because when you close your mouth, everything ends, and if you have to start anything new, you have to open your mouth again. So, it's ended. So, that M mm is deep sleep, Shushupti. But it doesn't end there. Upanishad says that when you ring a bell, for instance, or when you say Om, when you write Om in Sanskrit, on the top you will see a small crescent-like structure and a dot. This is called an Ardha Matra in Sanskrit, which means unstuck sound, Anahat. When I say Om, is it abrupt? It like Om. That ringing of the bell that continues, represents what the Upanishad Mandukya calls Turiya. Now what could Turiya be? Turiya is defined in the Upanishad as that which cannot be defined. <laughs> Are they fooling us? I don't know. That which cannot be defined, which cannot be put into words, which is subtle, subtler than even deep sleep. Huh? And it is as if in deep sleep, in the complete rest called deep sleep, awareness is there. If in deep sleep or Shushupti there is real awareness at that point, not when you wake up, of how blissful it was, but that point, then that would be Turiya. Everything is at rest, but you are aware of that complete rest. And you know this is my true self. However, there is no way by which you can go into Turiya through Shushupti. Otherwise, it would have been very easy. You only need to sleep and sleep and one day you go into Turiya. This is not possible. You cannot go into Turiya through Shushupti, but through Shushupti you can understand what roughly Turiya could be in our limited mode of thinking. I am saying this because I think our mode of thinking is quite limited. We need to go beyond. That will be then tomorrow's discussion. We won't go into that because I'll continue with the rest of the slokas. Uh, so, I think we will stop here for the time being and open to questions for maybe half an hour or so. So, I think I have kind of introduced you, introduced us, into the study of consciousness as in the human being. Not with the electrodes attached and all that kind of thing. We'll look into that later. But at the moment, looking into our consciousness, which anybody, you and me, any common person can do without taking the help of any gadget. We all know we, are, we have a waking state. We all know we have a dream state. We all know we have deep sleep. Hopefully. Only thing we don't know is about Turiya. If there is such a state existing or not. And the entire study of the Upanishads is to take one there step by step. So may I now close to this class? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Guruji. Uh, Rahul, can you please take over? So those who have questions may raise their hands. Vishujit is asking some questions.
Uh, yeah. Hello, sir. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, so I wanted this uh, wanted to ask this that you started with saying that the Upanishad starts with or uh, describing the Om and Brahman, that all that there is uh, is Brahman and it is represented by Om. But then it we are only talking about the states of consciousness in which these states are only experienced by the living and sentient beings. For example, the table and all living things do not experience these states. Then why are we calling? When we are calling everything as Brahman, but we are describing only the conscious beings. So, can you elaborate on this? Ah, okay, okay. So, are you saying that a table, for instance, which is not a sentient, uh, uh, like a living being, huh, can is it, no, no, does it have con? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, yes. Now, now, is there any way by which we can know that the table also has some form of consciousness, even though it may be quite rudimentary? Is there any way we can find out? No. It depends on how you define uh, this thing. That what is the mechanism of some? How do we right. ascribe something as right. uh, exactly permanent of a sin? Right. Yeah. Now I'm going to tell you something interesting. Uh, Consciousness in its highest state of evolution, at the moment, highest state of evolution, is in the human being who can recognize that I am conscious, right? A living being can recognize that I am conscious, while a non-living being could, there may be conscious, but it cannot recognize that it is conscious. I can say, yes, I exist. A table generally wouldn't say I exist because it doesn't have the evolutionary mechanism called the brain by which it can recognize consciousness. But that does not mean that there is some form of rudimentary consciousness even in that. Uh, as far as living things are concerned, even the single-celled organism called amoeba mm. is fully conscious. It divides itself, it spreads itself, it eats, it drinks. But a physical object doesn't do that. So we often say, oh, how can it be uh, conscious? Right? Slowly, let's proceed. <clears throat> now, do you think trees are conscious? I mean, you can define something and call them conscious because they have right. some underlying processes. Correct. They are doing some processes where they, they don't have a brain. This is what I'm trying to tell you. They don't have a fixed spot in the, in the tree, like a human being, where there is a physical organism called brain, which is supposed to be coordinating the consciousness. It doesn't have. And yet, every cell in the tree probably has some kind of intelligence. Now, intelligence means consciousness. Without that, there is no intelligence. Now, why? Because when there is no water, the roots of the tree go and try to find water. There is no brain, which means there is inbuilt intelligence in it. Inbuilt intelligence means there can be no intelligence without some consciousness. Okay, then when there is no sunrise, sunshine, then the branches grow this way so that they can get the sun. And photosynthesis is an activity that is going on in the tree. So now we have come from a conscious human being who is conscious of consciousness to that which is a tree which is also seems to be conscious and intelligent in some way even though it does not have a brain, an organ of consciousness. Okay, next step. I mean, I understand that you can extend yeah. it to the processes of the... Like, yes. Slowly, right. slowly, slowly we can go there. <laughs> Let's go But there. then the follow-up question would be then all of them would be that, like the Sushupti state because even in our Sushupti state there are processes going inside our brain and we are not conscious of it. And so the uh, even the plants, they are not conscious of it. So are we saying that all of these then are Sushupti, only this one state of consciousness which is the no, 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 no. Sushupti is the word used particularly to describe the human state, not the tree state. Uh, it, it, it is because the human being fortunately is, be, is able to understand this himself. The tree, if you cannot ask the tree anyway, but even, I don't believe a tree cannot answer, but we, we probably won't hear what the answer is. You see, in ancient times when they, they worship trees, if you worship trees, will you cut trees? No. So, that saved a lot of cutting of trees, which is rampant today. We need timber, I understand. 
Okay, now the next step. The physical object which is not a tree, even though the wood may have been cut from the tree, but it's not. So it's neither looking for water nor looking for sunshine, right? But what is it made of? Molecules. And what are molecules made of? Atoms. And what are atoms made of? Quantum units. Now all these quantum units seem to behave in certain ways, even though they don't have a physical brain. They react, they behave in certain ways. The electron moves from one shell to the other. How, who, what decides how it moves? Yeah, there's an underlying process. Or under, underlying. So all I'm saying is, as a hypothesis, mm -hmm. don't rule out the fact that even an inanimate object may be having some consciousness. Let's, let's keep it, suspend our judgment. That's all I'm saying. And then proceed from there. So the four states are only for humans, like the order living, yes. living beings. No, only living beings can recognize this. But hmm. the rishis say, and it is also the experience of people who have moved a little bit on this path, that once you feel and understand your consciousness in all your three states, then you can also probably feel the consciousness which is not active in inanimate beings also. Hmm. There is no instrument by which it can be measured. Except our mind, our consciousness. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So first, there could be like different different categories for different, different quite possi things. Quite possible. Mm -hmm. Quite possible. When you ancient hymns are there, Aushadiya Shanti, may the trees be at peace. Next, shall we shift? Yeah. We'll, we'll meet again. <laughs> I like the question. Okay. Nitesh, maybe you can move to Nitesh. Nitesh has raised his hand. Yes. Mantra chanting changes the consciousness stages and the how we can physiologically measure it and what are the correlates of the uh, mantra chantings which we can measure? Right. So, okay, first let me tell you this. The Upanishads, the function of the Upanishads is to explain, explain the deep inner meanings and the correlation of the mantras. This is the function of the Upanishads. But there is a completely different section which is called the science of chanting and mantras. In the Samhita portion, for instance, there is a mantra called the Gayatri in the Rig Veda. The mantra is so important that all the chandas or all the ways of chanting in that entire section are called Gayatri chandas. Hmm? And the Gayatri mantra has this meaning as well as an effect. In the same way, Om, the philosophical, psychological and the atmic understanding of Om is explained by the Upanishads. How to chant the sounds of Om or other mantras is described in the Mantra Shastras, not in the Upanishad per se. These are the philosophical sections. If you go to the Mantra Shastra, then there are modes and means in, by which you can use the mantras to bring about changes in our system as well as systems outside us. Yes. Um, now for that, one needs to first stimulate and awaken our intelligence from the gross to the subtle. The Gayatri Mantra's main function is what? What does it ask for, the Gayatri? Dhyo yohanap prachodayat May my intelligence be stimulated. Hmm? So, when the intelligence is stimulated, then you understand the meaning of the first part. Om Bhur Bhuva Suva. What you are asking for, Unless and until the mind has been purified, cleared and made sharp and one-pointed, 
you cannot bring about change using the mantras. So the whole process of mantra shastra is to make you fit to bring about the change in you through the use of sounds, use of mantras. That we will discuss when we come uh, to uh, the last part of the module given to me, which is practical, practical modules. We will come to that. I will give you, because you asked me the question, Atish, I will give you a section on mantra chanting also. There is no problem. But at the moment, what I want to tell you is the Upanishads deal with the inner aspects. So the, the essence of the Upanishad is very simple, which simply means that in you, in, your, in the core of your consciousness, the Supreme Self resides. When you tune in with that, for tuning in with that, you will require the help of Aurudmik chanting, mantras and everything. When you touch that self, then that self can influence other selves. So why I didn't go into the sound aspect and the chanting aspect of Om is because here we are looking at the philosophical aspect of Om. But since we are on the subject, let me tell you there are very different forms of chanting Om. There is two samples I'll show you. One is Aum. One, two, Aum. Do you see the difference? Yes. One starts with a, uh, goes slowly into u, and then ends with ma. Um, the second starts with O, A and U together, becoming O. And lot of stress is laid on the last syllable, Ma. Um, each has a certain effect. You know, the last syllable, O, um, sound, it heals the body rejuvenates the body, makes the cells more active. Now this has to be experimented, of course, since you are all scientists and so on. But we think so. It's our experience that it is so. And it's the most common sound that you hear when people are convalescing in hospitals, for instance. Somebody is very sick, they are convalescing. You go there, the most common sound you hear is mm, mm, mm. Naturally, because the mind knows that this is the sound that suits the cells and the whole system. So, each mantra in the mantra shastra applies to a certain function. But since the subject here is to understand self-discovery, so I started See, in the ancient Shastras, the Upanishads especially, there are several functions. In fact, they are called Saptaparana, seven petals. You start with one and you go deeper and deeper into the other layers. So we are dealing with one, philosophical now, which will connect us to the psychological and the inner. And then when we come to the practicals of how to touch it, then we'll go into all the mantra and this and that. Hmm? I hope. Hmm. Welcome. Uh, Professor, you had something to ask. Professor Bhupinder. Yeah, thank you, Shri. Thank you. So, I want to start off by first acknowledging you because uh, today's lecture, it was, uh, I mean, if I use one word, it is mantra mug. The way you've brought in uh, uh, my interest in it and in terms of uh, starting simply but still I can uh, sense there is some depth and there is opportunity to go deeper. So I thank you and yes. also organizers for setting up a system where you know it feels almost as if you're right there. <laughs> thank you. That's nice. Mm -hmm. the, we are doing the Upanishad, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I was kind of relating to that, that there was a proximity sense and uh, and, and that was there, like, I mean, even though the limitations you pointed with, uh, so thank you. I mean, acknowledge you. Sir. 
थैंक यू सर हाँ So uh, I was I was understanding you know Triya uh, that's the word you use right and the the fourth state is uh, Triya Turiya 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 and you know, you know some confusion about being the same as the Buddhist uh, state where uh, Nirvana the Nirvana and I was just wondering it does it really I mean uh, I am being little direct but does it really matter uh, whether they are the same or not because it even if they are the same it doesn't matter and unless one experiences matter. it it really is uh, i was only saying yeah you're right i'm only saying that some places it has been called nirvana uh, and what the uh, upanishads declare as purna has also been defined as shunya and the buddhist terminology is shunya but shunya doesn't mean nothing it doesn't mean it is a negation shunya means that which cannot be explained in any other way but which is the source of all that is there in this world which is the same as purna you know what i'm trying to say that people go completely out out of uh, tune because they discuss the uh, the denominations and the words used and so on finally it is you are right it is the same <laughs> that is no yes, difference. Sir, yeah, but my question now, I'm coming to it is, given that I'm, uh, uh, I fall into the seeker category, like I haven't experienced either of the states, neither Nirvana nor uh, Turiya. Right, right. And you have perhaps a, a deeper understanding in terms of progress. How to determine which of the, if I can use the word, paths is is most suitable for? That depends, sir, on your mental uh, build up and what you like and it it depends your on your capabilities your the seeds that you carry with you in your mind it's difficult for me to say that in a black and white fashion i mean i can't make a blanket statement on that but i am saying that whichever way you approach which appeals to you if you follow it properly and intelligently <coughs> then surely you can reach the goal <laughs> that i have no question sincerity and application of one pointedness is the key it's not what is the mode the mode could be anything i understand okay thank you thank you sir Surya so Gajanan Verma will raise his hand. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, yes. Sir, first of all, please uh, accept my humble obeisance. Uh, it's like a dream <laughs> to talk with you. Uh, sir, I have two questions. So first of all, uh, how to expand the consciousness beyond our body. So whenever I, I close my eyes, I can feel an area beyond which I can do something. So say I, if I am like I want to move my hand, I can do that. But I cannot move uh, anything in my surrounding. So I am not talking about the I, I do not want to talk about that, but it, that may be the higher stage. But beyond this body, it is but how, how I can expand. Uh, one minute. When you say how I can expand, are you talking about being able to touch and operate things which are outside your body and outside your reach, or or are you saying that you can you want to feel conscious not only in the body but also outside? Which one are you looking at? Sir, both I think because uh, I want to feel water. Two are, they are two are different. You need to first see the first before you go to the second. Uh, you know, when we live in this world, our brain decides our space. Uh, first of all, understand that there are two brains in the body. There's only one brain, but there are two sections. It's called the left brain and the right brain. The right brain takes care of some functions. 
and the left brain takes care of some functions. Right? The right brain is the intuitive brain and the left brain is the practical brain. It's all same. It's in the same. I'm saying the locations where these are. Nowadays, people, uh, neurologists have gone deep into this, little bit deep into this. So, it is the right brain, which is the um, intuitive brain, that says, look, I am Gajanan Varma. I am this high. This is my uh, size. And this is my reach. I cannot go beyond this. And I am conscious of myself. I am not conscious of the other. If, if you have a girlfriend, she is conscious of herself and you are conscious of yourself. You are not conscious of her. I mean, her consciousness you don't know, right? Hmm. So, I want you to read a book before we get back into this uh, called hmm. My Stroke My Stroke S-T-R-O-K-E of Insight I-N-S-I-G-H-T My Stroke of in Insight by someone called Jill Bolt. She, because you go through that, then we will discuss. This is your homework. Now, Jill Paul, um, one day, as a young age, she suddenly had a stroke. That's why she calls it the stroke of insight. And what happened is a brain hemorrhage, a stroke, brain hemorrhage. What happened was, the blood vessel broke in her brain and it happened sometimes, it's a rare thing, but it happened. And her left brain was fully flushed with blood and therefore it stopped functioning. Now you remember that the left brain is a practical brain, which decides where I am, this is my space, this is the other's space, arithmetic, mathematics, everything is looked after by the left brain. Measurement, space, idea of measurement, idea of space, that completely got paralyzed because of the stroke. She recovered from it afterwards, which was a miracle by itself. So when that happened, only her right brain was functioning for some time. Now this right brain is the intuitive brain. It doesn't measure. It's more intuition, consciousness, feeling. It rests in the right brain. So when this happened, suddenly she realized, somehow she managed to make a telephone call for emergency. After that, that also was over. She could not even remember numbers. Somehow she did that as soon as it started because she knew it was coming. When this only her right brain was working, the intuitive brain, she suddenly found that her body consciousness or her consciousness was not confined to her body consciousness, physical body consciousness. There was a bird sitting on the tree in front of her in the garden and chirping away. She found that it was not the bird, but she who was chirping from there. There were no boundaries to her consciousness. You know what I mean? She was the plant, the tree which was swaying in the wind. She was, not the tree. The whole world became her. She was not separated from it as a small uh, part of space. The whole space broke and there was everything together as one. Now, the experiences with the yogis speak of and the Vedantis speak of are very similar experiences. Not through hemorrhage, but similar experience. So, hmm. so I want you to go through this book and we are going to have many more sessions. And then come back, do your homework, and we'll work further on it. Thank Sir, you. I have I, I know a question also, but yeah. I think it's, if it is lacking time, I can ask it in the next session. Sure. 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 sure, let's give somebody else a chance. We have another five minutes or ten minutes. Sure. Thank you, Gajan. Cut. Mm. Just a small comment. There's a TED talk by the same person that's available at 15 minutes. Oh, oh really? really? Yes. You, you can listen to that. that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Ankit, Ankit, can you move to Ankit? Ankit has raised 
गुरुजी आई हैव वेरी टू फंडामेंटल क्वेश्चंस कि द फर्स्ट वन इज कि इन इन मॉडर्न न्यूरो साइंस कॉन्शियसनेस इज कंसीडर्ड एज द अवेयरनेस ओके हाउ एवर दिस टर्म हैज अ कंप्लीटली डिफरेंट मीनिंग इन आवर शास्त्रास यस so in what manner this particular terminology is different from two perspective one is a neuroscience and other is a shastra perspective right so what is the question so my question is in what manner this this uh, this particular term has a two different perspective sorry uh, this particular uh, term um it is different in in two perspective okay i would say that neurology has to go a little more further before it comes to the understanding of what we are trying to say mm. uh, neurology is gone a long is grown quite a deal but it still has to understand more uh, it has to understand the other organs of perception that the human being has even in his physical body even in the brain 20% of our brain is enough for us to function in this world to study to go to iit to, for everything 20% of our brain is enough what is the other 80% doing when the neurologists begin to go into that they will probably begin to understand the perspective of consciousness which we are talking about when i say we i mean those who are uh, yogis uh, those who are uh, experienced the vedantic understanding and so on so i fully appreciate the neurologists i think they should continue with the research and carry on with it till they reach the understanding of what the vedanta is trying to say they are not two things it's a Uh, i would rather say that if a neurologist comes to this understanding and says ah this is what it is people are likely to accept it more than a layman like me saying that so ankit uh, i want you to read the upanishads i want you also to study some good books by uh, neurologists i would recommend uh, Uh, one of my friends uh, good friends book called uh, uh, phantoms in the brain by vilayanur ramachandran v ramachandra He is a neurologist at the moment a very famous important neurologist living in san diego the united states i would want you to first read the book called uh, phantoms in the brain mm -hmm. okay and then after reading that then we can further the discussion on this we also believe that the brains and the neurons the brain the neurons in the brain are as very important to understand not only ourselves but the consciousness which is outside our body beyond our body beyond the limitations uh, but we study it in a little different way than the neurologists study it but i have a feeling that in a 50 years or so roughly i'm just speculating that this will meet and that meeting will be a tremendous revelation for the world so i have great respect for neurologists because the, the only thing i ask is please don't rule out that there are other ways of arriving at the truth than the ways which you are talking about ha huh? ji yeah so give it some thought food for thought for you ji and uh, uh, another question very simple question yes please uh in Uh, as you have said, that there must be some link between the neurons and the consciousness, which our youths talk about. So, modern neuroscience considers the three states: the waking state, dreaming state, and deep sleep state, as emerging from the interaction between individual neurons or the interaction between distinct brain regions. Okay. Uh, so, in what sense the fourth state, the Turiya state, is linked to the neuronal interactions? 
<laughs> the problem, Ankit, is that the neurologist is not even thinking about Turiya, the fourth state. So they don't, they're not even discussing what neurological reactions are taking place in Turiya. Because as far as they're concerned, I think the Turiya does not exist. Only three states exist, waking, dream and deep sleep. Now, having said that, I must also say that now there is a lot of neurological uh, interest uh, among the scientists on the state where people are in a, uh, what's it called? They appear totally unconscious. Coma. Coma. Coma, coma states are now coming into mainstream neurology. And I think as they experiment and go deep into the understanding of the coma state, they will probably then begin to think of Turiya, what it could be. Or catch hold of a yogi who is experiencing these different states, put them in a neurological lab, put all the electrodes and see what's happening. This is also possible. I'm not ready, but uh, <laughs> I'm worried about the electrodes. <laughs> What if I go in as M and come out as C or somebody who knows? <laughs> I'm joking, Ankit. Ah, so, okay. Right. Thank you. Sir, it's almost time. Uh, yeah. I think we are all peace here. Today's session. Uh, uh, sir, okay, so there's no other hands Session, but if you permit me, you know, you know, arouse my curiosity enough to ask a question. If you think, Sir. Yeah. So, you talked about this altered state of consciousness, specifically, this person, this lady, Jit Bolti Taylor, who had a stroke and got into a different state of consciousness. He also talked about Ramachandra. And in one of his documentaries, he describes what is called a temporal lobe epilepsy. And, you know, one particular case that he describes, this person having a temporal lobe epilepsy actually starts believing that he is the god. Which is the <laughs> Brahmasmi statement that you made in, in this thing earlier. Mm. So, this is what we have to be very careful about. There are many such gods perhaps in India also, or around the world. So, well... The science of yoga and the science of Vedanta are step by step systematic movement into these things. They are not like something that happened suddenly, all of a sudden. Perhaps that guy feels he's God because his science's consciousness expanded and he has no other idea of what it could be. This is also possible. Uh, but what I'm trying to say. Temporal lobe epilepsy, for instance, means that certain parts of the temporal lobe, the neurons, are overactive. This is the case. We believe that there are many parts of the brain which can be activated, which are now not active. Yeah, but that is not done with an instrument or an electric charge or something but through proper one-pointed attention and meditative techniques coupled with sound. So, these go in a very controlled fashion, or you can say laboratory conditions, yogic laboratory conditions. So, there is no chance of that turning into something like what Ramachandran describes in the temporal lobe epilepsy patient. In fact, there are known cases of some great poetry being written by people who have temporal lobe epilepsy. So, which means that the potential is there. And as far as the neurologists can see today, they see isolated cases where it has happened accidentally and where the person who himself doesn't know what's going on. Here we are saying the same thing can be done properly, step by step, so that the neurons can actually be activated as we want. So then this comes to the next question. Can we consciously interfere with the neurons? Our consciousness is produced by the neurons, generally, most of what we call consciousness. Can that consciousness influence the neurons? So, these are wider questions. Maybe we can go into it again as we go along.
Thank you. Sir. Question is more from the point of view of person having these experiences. Yeah. That you know, the person could think that he has got realization, but he may be you know hallucinating or getting other kinds of things. So how does ah, one? That I will uh, explain as we go along. In it, yeah, because there are some perfect criteria for that from the yogic point of view. If that does not exist, the person is probably undergoing hallucination. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thoughtful question, but it's, it's an important question because that will eliminate most madmen who think they are gods. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll meet again next session. Thank you very much. It was a joy, wonderful uh, discussion. I am so glad. Thank you.